Good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Storms. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the executive director at the ACLU of Washington. I'm excited to welcome you to another virtual Flights and Rights. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight, the speakers and I join you from the occupied territory of the Coast, Coast Salish and Yakima people. Indigenous people were lied to, treaties were broken, and their land was stolen. The very origins of the United States include this original sin of stealing of native land and the killing of indigenous people. We must remain committed to fighting for justice for all. This acknowledgement is a critical and necessary step toward honoring native communities and having a larger conversation on decolonization and reconciliation. So my friends, this is as complicated a time as ever. Right now, even as we celebrate pride and resilience, we are also grieving so heavily the many black lives brutally ended at the hands, the knees, the guns of police. In addition to this, fatal violence disproportionately affects transgender women of color, particularly black transgender women. If you take a look at the chat box, you will see some of the names of the black trans lives lost this year alone. And these are just the ones we know about and we grieve these lost lives, these precious souls. We grieve while we also work to survive multiple pandemics, health pandemics, racism pandemics, transphobic, homophobic trans uh, pandemics. It's a complicated time. But the promise of progress is palpable. We have to make space to celebrate our hard fought wins and I want to share some of those with you. One, very locally, that we just learned about important progress in fighting mass incarceration in Washington's largest county. King County is rolling out a new vision for adult and youth detention later this week that includes eventually closing the downtown jail and converting the youth detention facility into community space and programs. At last. Today, youth detention numbers are down to 21, and by 2025, if not sooner, youth detention will be converted to therapeutic and community space. We are grateful to the community, to all the folks on the ground who've been advocating for so long for this real change. To our surprise, we also have some exciting Supreme Court decisions to celebrate. Okay, first, indigenous people got some land back. In Oklahoma, much of Eastern Oklahoma, including Tulsa, belongs to them once again, as was promised, and state authorities may not prosecute cases involving indigenous people on that land. Here's another one. The court decided the president doesn't have absolute immunity from subpoena. More, the court rejected the Trump administration's inhumane attempt to end DACA and jeopardize the lives of 700,000 beautiful dreamers. The court also put an end to Louisiana's misguided, misguided law, heavily misguided law requiring doctors who perform abortions to have admitting privileges at a nearby hospital, uh, a rule that virtually made it impossible for um, many doctors to carry out abortions. The court ruled that an employer cannot fire an individual merely for being gay or transgender. And we're so happy to be here to talk more about this one tonight. So let's just engage in a little virtual cheer about this very good news. Okay, so let me step back and do a little housekeeping about our event and then I will introduce our speakers. As you know, our flights and rights events are typically hosted in breweries and event spaces around the state and here in Seattle, most often in the gathering space of KEXP, 90.3 FM in Seattle, KEXP.org, everywhere else in the world. Uh, we're so honored to be able to partner with KEXP and we also want you to hop over to Spotify to listen to our Pride playlist, specially curated for tonight's Flights and Rights, and to KEXP's Pride podcast created by DJ Riz and former KEXP DJ El Toro. So make dinner, enjoy a drink, dance like no one is watching, dance like someone is watching if that's what you prefer, because there's a huge uh, <laughs> opportunity to celebrate and music heals. In addition to KEXP's generosity and support, each in-person flights and rights is sponsored by a local brewery. Check out the chat box also for a link to support our partner breweries who have graciously donated to us and we wanna be sure to support them during this time that is so difficult for small business. 
So tonight we're celebrating pride by learning from brilliant advocates. And while an hour is never enough to do more than scratch the surface, I know you'll take this farther on your own and in your own community. So here's who we have online tonight. We're going to have Denise Diskin. Denise joins the Q Law Foundation as its first ever executive director after nearly 10 years of legal practice representing individuals harmed by discrimination with a particular focus on cases impacting individuals with multiple marginalized identities. As an advocate, Denise enjoys working in partnership with her clients, creating strategies together, and working to build individual and community power through informed legal decision making. She's a frequent speaker on employment discrimination, healthcare coverage for transgender and non-binary people, and LGBTQ plus access to the legal system. Second, we'll hear from Leah Rutman. Leah is the Healthcare and Liberty Council at ACLU. Prior to joining the ACLU in 2013, Leah practiced commercial litigation at an international law firm and worked and volunteered at various human rights organizations. Leah is a graduate of McGill University and Columbia University School of Law, and outside of work, she can be found exploring Seattle beaches and hikes and spending time with her kids. And back for their second appearance out of Flights and Rights, I'm excited to welcome Ebony Miranda. Ebony Miranda is a community organizer whose work centers around the LGBTQIA community and communities of color. In 2017, they were an organizer and social media chair for the Women's March in Seattle. In 2018, they founded Black Lives Matter Seattle King County and are currently the board chair. As a representative for BLM, they have done work with the Families Belong Together Coalition and Seattle Indivisible, Indivisible where Ebony currently serves as an advisory board member. Next up, we're excited to welcome Wel Elaine Wiley, co-executive director of Gender Justice League. Elaine is Gender Justice League's first board chair, currently serving as the co-executive director at uh, Gender Justice League. She's a longtime Seattle trans civil and human rights activist and fixture in the trans community. She's also a seasoned film producer. Previously, she served on the boards of both Ingersoll Gender Center, Gender Center and Seattle Out and Proud and is a 2011 graduate of the Out in Front LGBT Leadership Program. Finally, I am thrilled to have us joined by Jalen Scott. Jalen moved to the Pacific Northwest from Denver to serve as Minister and Director of Unitarian Universalist Education Program. In her previous careers, she's worked as a Director of HR, Operations and Education, and regularly preached and facilitated workshops on justice and mindfulness in her previous career as Minister and Religious Educator. She's passionate about queer and trans liberation, sacred practices for self-care, decolonizing labor practices, and mindfulness in the workplace, something that we all need. So what will happen is each one of them is going to give a little bit of a description of whatever they want to share with you. Then I'm going to lead them through some questions, but you are welcome to throw your questions out whenever you like. Type your questions or comments in the Q&A box and check out the chat box for important links and other details. So we're gonna get started with these beautiful humans and uh, I will circle back. So let us begin with Denise, you have the floor. Hi everybody, it's so nice to be here with you all tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been admiring these events from afar for a while, so it's a real honor to be here and I'm truly honored to be here with all of these other panelists. Um, as Michelle said, I'm the Executive Director of QLaw Foundation of Washington. Um, we provide legal support by, for, and about LGBTQ communities. Um, we really see the strength of our communities as being in our networks of shared knowledge. Um, and I think that, you know, what I mean by that is, is I think a lot of marginalized groups are very familiar with this idea that um, you have networks of shared knowledge to figure out which employers, which doctors, which landlords, even which social services organizations are going to be safe and affirming of your, your identity, your family, your community. Um, and Q Law Foundation really works to bring legal services providers and the legal system, which are typically very cis and straight focused, into relationship with LGBTQ communities in an honoring way. Um, we really work to be a legal organization that is led by our partnerships, the work that we do with organizations like Lavender Rights Project, Entre Hermanos, LGBTQ Allyship, and our community movements to really leverage that credibility that we hold as lawyers within the legal system to push movements forward. Um, and I can tell you workers' rights in particular are very close to my heart. I started my career as a labor organizer um, and 
spent 10 years as a litigator representing employees in discrimination cases. Um, so the recent Supreme Court cases, and specifically the Bostock case, uh, which just came out on June 15th, um, uh, were really important to me. They were cases I was following for a long time, and, and I was, um, you know, very much, uh, I think, like many folks, waiting <laughs> um, uh, to see what the courts were going to do. Um, and the, when the Bostock case came out, what it said is that LGBTQ people are protected under federal employment discrimination laws. Um, when we talk about the Bostock case, we're really actually talking about three cases, um, two brought by white gay men, one brought by a white trans woman. Um, and I really believe that employment discrimination cases are first and foremost about stories. Um, and the stories of these cases are very powerful. These were employees who loved their jobs, were very good at their jobs, and were fired for things that, some things that seem silly, like joining a gay softball league, um, and some things that are very profound, like living as their true self. Um, what the court held in, those, in, in this case is that where employment discrimination law says sex discrimination is unlawful, that includes sexual orientation and gender identity. Because if you fire someone for traits or actions that are related to sexual orientation or gender identity, the relationships that you have or the gender that you live in, you are firing that person for traits or actions that you wouldn't have questioned in members of a different sex. Um, this was really an incredible decision, mostly in its clarity. Um, there is, it doesn't really leave a lot of room for confusion that when the court says, you can't even identify an employee as LGBTQ in order to treat them differently and worse for that reason without engaging in, in consideration of their sex. And in that clarity, what the case said is that LGBTQ employees are valuable, deserve to be treated that way, and that the traits that are such an intrinsic part of who LGBTQ people are cannot be siloed away from other parts of our identities. And this is really important because I think some of the history of the case law that um, is that, you know, often LGBTQ folks who experienced employment discrimination were put in the position of kind of having to say, well, you know, this part of my experience was about my sexual orientation, but this part of my experience was about my race or about my sex or about my religion or other aspects and really having to sort of slice and dice different um, experiences of discrimination. In this case, essentially said, nope, this is all in one, all in one bucket. Um, but I do want to really emphasize that these cases, and, and this case from the US Supreme Court, this, these cases are not what give us rights. No one ever got liberated by a court setting a bare minimum for how a marginalized group can be treated. Um, workplaces are communities too. That's part of why I love workers' rights, right? We spend um, as much time with our colleagues as we do with our families, um, certainly before COVID. And now I think, um, you know, even, even after COVID, I think we're all learning where that line is in new, new ways. So when we talk about healthy workplaces, we're talking about building healthy communities and that work of building healthy communities is just beginning. And I'm really, I think that that's a, honestly a lot of what we're gonna be talking about tonight and I'm really excited about that. So thank you very much. Leah. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here tonight, or virtually be with all of you tonight. Um, my name is Leah Rutman, and I'm the Healthcare Liberty Council at the ACLU of Washington. Um, and I wanted to start tonight by talking a little bit about uh, the most recent HHS rule that impacts, strongly impacts the LGBTQ community, uh, specifically the one relating to section, section 1557. So as many of you probably already know, this particular provision was really groundbreaking. It provides comprehensive discrimination protections in the healthcare context, which didn't previously exist. Uh, it specifically discriminates, says prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex, along with many other grounds. And it really covers a broad range of healthcare entities, basically any receiving federal financial assistance. Um, and it was part of the Affordable Care Act. So when it was passed, there was excitement, there was joy. Um, and then you had 2016 come along. And in 2016, an Obama administration decided uh, to promulgate a rule, which is basically interpreting 
uh, the Section 1557 law. And it was a good rule, I would say. It did many things, but for the purposes of tonight, some of the things that it did is it looked at that statement of you can't discriminate on the basis of sex, and it made it really explicit that when we're talking about sex, that includes gender identity, and that includes sex stereotypes, right? Um, it also added in very specific explicit protections for transgender individuals and non-discrimination provisions relating to gender identity. Uh, it also reinforced that these were really broad protections. It covered most entities, most healthcare entities. We're talking medical providers, we're talking health systems, and we're talking insurers. Three years later, we have a very different administration, as I think we all know. Um, and on June 12th, and I really want us all to focus on June 12th, so during Pride Month, on the anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting, and literally days before the decision that Denise was talking about, so a decision that was going to define what does or does not constitute sex in, under Title VII, this administration decided to come out with new final rules relating to Section 1557. So really thumbing its nose at both the LGBT community and frankly the Supreme Court. So what happened in that situation? Uh, basically, what this new rule does is it does a few things. It eliminates the definition section. So that means where previously it said sex includes gender identity and sex stereotypes and other things, that's gone. It didn't replace it with anything though, but this administration has made it clear that when they enforce this, they are gonna interpret sex solely as quote unquote biological sex. Um, it also eliminated those specific discrimination provisions that I was talking about in regards to gender identity. Um, and it minimized, to a degree, how many health entities were covered by this. So before it was basically everyone, and it, it narrowed that. It didn't narrow it completely, but it narrowed it a little. It did many other problematic things in terms of religious exemptions, language access, disability rights, but those are the ones we're focusing on tonight. And what does that really mean? Well, it means it's bad. It means there are fewer health entities. I fell in laugh when I said that. It's bad. I think we all know that. Um, it means fewer health entities are required to be covered by this, which sucks. We want any, everyone to be covered by anti-discrimination provisions, and it's really problematic when they're not. Um, it also means that explicit protections for the LGBT community have been rolled back, and that's a big problem, and we have to fight that, and we have already seen case after case being filed around the country in opposition to these rules. There is a ray of hope, though, and I really want to make this really clear tonight because while we no longer have the rule that explicitly says, yes, sex is defined to include gender identity and sex stereotypes, et cetera, that doesn't mean that section 1557 still doesn't actually include protections for people who want to bring claims for gender identity, et cetera. You still can't discriminate on that basis. And that's because the language itself, discrimination on the basis of sex, Sex includes gender identity, sex includes sex stereotypes. Um, the Supreme Court case that Denise was just talking about, it, it said it's impossible to discriminate against a person for being homosexual or transgender without discriminating against that individual based on sex. And while that was under Title VII, and here we're talking about Section 1557 and Title IX, the same logic applies. On, on the basis of what language is in the law, those protections still apply. So while it is definitely a rollback of explicit protections, we still do have those anti-discrimination provisions that will continue to be enforced and that we will continue be, to be able to bring to the courts. Thank you, Leah. Ebony. Hi, um, just want to thank uh, you again, Michelle, and the ACLU for having me for a second one of these. Um, I have to admit, I, even though I have given many speeches and talks and things, even with the last flights and rights I did regarding COVID and race, um, it's still very rare for me as a trans person to speak more to that experience in particular. So. Um, I'm really honored and happy to have that experience um, because this is a very, I guess, new thing for me. 
Um, but yes, yeah, just a little bit about me. I am a co-founder and current chair of Black Lives Matter Seattle King County. Um, and even <laughs> listening to my bio, it's interesting just seeing how much that role and my, my work uh, during this time has changed even in a short amount of time. But um, I guess a, a good point to note about our organization and, and this chapter of Black Lives Matter Seattle um, is really understanding the uh, premise of our formation and what really inspired that. And actually a really big part of that um, is that we wanted to make it very known that our leadership within our chapter is really focused on Black women, femmes, queer, and trans people, because we understand that um, oftentimes, even looking through history, if you think about uh, civil rights and social justice movements, it's still very difficult for marginalized genders as a whole and in Black community to really get, get um, noticed and, and give the credit for their leadership and the work that they put into these movements. Um, and that it can be more difficult for us to have our voices heard in our um, issues uh, at the table, really. And so that's something that us as a chapter have really um, focused on over these past few years and especially in this moment now. Um, I mean, some of the demands that we've been working on, uh, of course, the big one would be defunding the Seattle Police Department by 50% and using that money to be transferred more into community wellness services, um, as well as ending youth incarceration. And it was really incredible to see that news come out this week. Um, just because, I mean, it's the amount of people that have put work into making that happen. Um, has been truly inspiring to witness. And so that's a community win for everyone as well. Uh, but also focusing more, yes, on, on community wellness. That's been something that's been a really big push for us, um, as well as getting, you know, racism to be declared a public health issue and advocating for more community-centric mental health and wellness services, um, affordable housing, ending encampment sweeps, um, and really making an effort to end um, just the homelessness crisis in Seattle in general. Um, <clears throat> and with that too, what we've been working with at the county level and what we want to push to the state level is more dedicated, um, dedicated resources for documenting hate and bias crimes, particularly against Black, POC, and LGBTQIA individuals. Um, and that's for several reasons. I mean, I, part of it when we talk about, you know, BLM and police brutality and all these issues, a lot of people understand that our communities aren't really wants to go to um, the police or authorities because we know our experience with them. And sometimes I believe that not everyone understands that trans people also have that experience a lot as well and that we too don't always seek out those <laughs> entities for support. And so creating a space and a coalition and an environment where um, we can have more understanding and research against of the violence that we face and that we experience and as we've been witnessing um, is also going to be very impactful to understand how we can thrive more um, in our country and in our society as a whole. Um, and currently that's just something that's incredibly underreported um, and hoping to really change that. We've already gotten that going at the county level, but getting that at the state level would also be really helpful. And overall, this, this moment that we've been witnessing, right? Like um, the last time I was here, it was right after George Floyd was murdered and we've all witnessed just the impact of that. And also within that, the wins that have also been um, expressed before us. And it's, it, it's given me a lot of time to reflect um, on a personal level as well through all the work and um, thinking about my own personal experience about learning about Title VII and how much I was waiting for that um, ruling to be finalized um, because I, on a, I have really struggled with being out at my jobs out of fear of discrimination. At one of my jobs, I, I was actually medically transitioning and didn't feel comfortable to even be open about that and just having to really conceal a huge part of who I was um, for out of fear and out of fear of discrimination, out of fear of rejection, and yes, out of fear of losing my job. So I think in general, this moment is really asking us to um, reflect on a lot of our biases on the greater scale of how all of these issues impact everyone in the intersectionality that, re that it requires. Um, and I hope that when we do talk about all these issues uh, that people start to understand that they all affect 
trans people as well, um, usually at an even greater level. Um, so I thank you for having me here and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ebony. Excited to welcome Elaine into the conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, Gender Justice League was founded in 2012 uh, when we saw a deep need in our community, not just for uh, internal private support groups, but uh, a, a stronger base of activists. And um, if you've heard our name, it does sound like a comic book superhero collective. We were all fighting uh, on our own in, in individual ways in our community and fielding these kinds of, of issues. So we decided to come together as a flat collective and eventually formed ourselves into a, a more traditional looking nonprofit. Uh, we launched to Trans Pride uh, Seattle in 2013 and uh, over the years of growing that to we had about 25,000 people in attendance last year. Uh, we were formed to not only fight discrimination based on um, uh, sex and gender and uh, uh, sexual orientation but to also really help foster and create and support community. Um, we've been fighting erasure by trans exclusionary feminist groups, religious organizations. In 2017, we began housing trans people in our office space. We remain engaged in the major social issue around housing and homelessness, both in Seattle and around the region. Transgender and non-binary folks experience the binary gender enforced shelter and housing system with extreme bias towards them from other residents and a deep lack of knowledge from staff and administration. Last week, the Federal Health and Human Services proposed a new rule allowing shelters to visually identify transgender and non-binary people by physical characteristics uh, and using those to exclude those from uh, shelter systems. And uh, that would identify trans people by those physical characteristics and ensuring even more trans people are targeted. Non-binary folks must often choose a binary shelter scenario that isn't safe for them, but might be slightly safer than another choice. Uh, and these are all uh, really deeply and unjust systems that we're, uh, we're fighting. Um, and yes, uh, just like similar to the ACLU, when the Washington Attorney General's office filed a lawsuit against HHS regarding the new rule to strip Obama era protections from trans people seeking health care. Uh, we also filed a, um, a declaration uh, in support of that based on years uh, of fielding complaints from our community based on both insurance injustice and also discrimination from uh, healthcare institutions and people in the community. Um, so we remain uh, on top of that issue as well. Uh, we also look at a gender justice league protections for sex workers who are severely embattled due to a typical conflation between sex work and sex trafficking. Uh, folks aren't even willing to consider, many of them are not willing to, to consider sex trafficking uh, and sex work as separate issues. So we spend a lot of time really educating uh, lawmakers on that. Um, finally, non-binary and gender diverse folks have found avenues to obtain ID that reflects their gender, uh, birth certificates and state ID, about 20 states across the nation do that, but there are few and likely zero protections for those folks to seek remedy when public and private sectors utilize software that recognizes and relies on binary gender. So as I said earlier, in 2017, we began housing trans people in our office space because we found that so many shelters were very discriminatory. So uh, we got an office space that had a loft, a full bathroom with a shower, a small kitchenette, laundry facilities nearby. And so uh, we engaged in the city uh, services or, uh, around serving people experiencing gender-based violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, and commercial sexual exploitation. And so uh, we're actively engaged in that work and also in educating local organizations around how they can serve trans people. We don't want them to just send everyone to us. We actually want them to be able to serve our community as well. So thank you. Thanks, Elaine, such powerful work. Jaylen, ready to hear from you. Hi, it's uh, such a pleasure to be with all of you. I don't know if it was mentioned, I'm the uh, executive director of uh, Lavender Rights Project. Um, work with a lot of community partners who are here on this call. A lot of our work does, uh, there's a lot of overlap um, with the work that we are doing. Um, at Lavender Rights Project, we 
are filling a void uh, that happened about five years ago, um, a need that arose for LGBTQ plus specific services, uh, legal services. There were others providing it, um, but there was a lot of clients who weren't comfortable with uh, both cisgender and also um, straight law firms handling their cases. Uh, many of uh, many organizations like the ACLU and others do larger advocacy campaigns, and uh, we are one of the few, as well as I believe Q Law is doing some now too. Um, providing direct services for LGBTQ plus clients. In addition to the work that we do there, um, we do programming around LGBTQ plus inclusivity, including along with Elaine and other partners in Ingersoll, uh, speaking with organizations uh, about their employment practices and HR practices for full inclusion. Uh, we have some advocacy campaign work and uh, one of the bigger projects uh, that we're also working on is the Black Trans Task Force and I'm the founding member of the Black Trans Task Force. I really uh, bring that forward first in this conversation. Uh, the Black Trans Task Force uh, is looking at the problem of violence in the Black trans community. You'll see the list, and thank you so much, uh, uh, Michelle, for putting that list up. Uh, there's 14, 14 uh, Black trans people who are more murdered. I think Tatiana Hall is actually missing off this list. And that is this year, this is in 2020. And so um, it is a problem, it's an epidemic. And we're trying to look at it as an epidemic and figure out what are all of those pieces? Like what are the hierarchy of needs around folk to get a sense of protection for each individual black trans person? That includes housing, that includes healthcare, um, it includes security, education, uh, and et cetera. Uh, I, I really am appreciative of this conversation, specifically Leah, and um, conversations about uh, Title VII and uh, Section 1557. The one thing I'm, I'm here to say, uh, I'm not an attorney, uh, so uh, I'm learning a lot in this conversation, but I'm here to say for each of these, right, Black trans folk have a completely different res uh, response to it. And that means that, or it has a different response on them. So it means we can celebrate that the Supreme Court has um, uh, opened up uh, our ability to actually file EEOC complaints. Uh, complaints. We're pretty good in the state of Washington which are, with our Washington law against discrimination, but across uh, the country, there's an opening up for transgender folk to have protection, but that doesn't necessarily translate to the black trans community, not immediately, because we're missing this, this piece of a access. So access to attorneys, access to the law, access to the knowledge that we actually have protections. And in addition to uh, the discrimination against us because of who we are uh, or, or our gender identity, we're, we have this intersection of race um, that comes into play. And so you have racism and you have gender. And if you're talking about black trans women, not just trans, tra being transgender, also uh, misogyny, that, that is just a really deadly, a literally deadly combination, deadly combination. So, you know, in thinking of specifically the uh, HHS uh, rule, uh, it's about a quarter of us who are um, uh, having HIV or immune, uh, who are immune compromised. Uh, another quarter of us are, don't really have access to health insurance, um, not even Medicaid or Obamacare. And uh, in addition to that, there's about 40% of us, 40 or 50% of us who can't afford to go to the doctor even with that. And so we have to think about if there is discrimination going to happen or if there's, if there's going to be some sense of em emboldening of medical professionals to discriminate against us, especially in areas less progressive uh, than the Pacific Northwest then that's going to directly affect us because it really is a Trojan horse. It's an ability to throw in your racism, it's ability to throw in your misogyny and use the excuse of, oh, you are transgender to not allow us in the, in the room and in space and to get our healthcare needs, which extend far beyond gender identity and our needs around gender. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I just feel so honored to be on this panel with you all. I feel so honored to have you all, um, and uh, you're all powerful advocates in lots of different ways, and we need all the different ways to solve some of these highly intractable problems. Um, Jalen, if you don't mind, I'm going to just stay with you for a minute, and um, you, you've alluded to it, but I want, uh, I, I would love for you to just 
articulate what you would describe as perhaps the greatest threat to Black trans women and what are things that people who care about Black trans women and all humans can do uh, in support of that? Yeah, lack of visibility. Lack of visibility. visibility. The theme that sort of runs through our lives um, is being invisible. And that means that our murders are, are invisible, that our lives are invisible, that our power is invisible, that the effect of uh, discriminatory rulings on us, it's, it's, we're disappeared. And this being in the uh, shadows uh, is, the, is the greatest threat to our lives. Because if you actually knew, and if people actually knew what was happening to us, they would center our needs in the work that they're doing. And that's what people can do. If they're asking anything they can do, get informed, get some knowledge about, learn about what exactly is happening to our community. And also find those areas where you can celebrate our lives because we're not just the trauma that, that, that we experience. We have in the midst of, I mean, because we're black, in the midst of so much suffering, we have figured out how to bring out our fabulousness and, and, and celebration. And those pieces, you know, we're the, we are the creators of pride. Um, we started pride, we have sustained pride. Uh, we are the creators of art. We are the creators of so many things and that, that most people um, in America benefit from, in our culture, benefit from our cultural creation. So look at those things and appreciate the many things in your lives that you have now that were created by us, including the way you put your makeup on. Right, a number of things that we have given you. And so celebrate that. But as you celebrate, look at the stats. Look at the stats. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. This feels like a good segue for me to come to Ebony. And, and uh, there was something that you said that really resonates for me. And you know, when you think about the history of civil rights, most people can name a whole lot of men, a whole lot of cis men, right? Uh, they can, uh, black men who moved forward that, that movement. And so you talked about with, uh, in the founding of Black Lives Matter, Seattle King County, you, got, you all were really focused on uh, women, femme, queer, trans individuals as leaders. And I, I wanted to just have you expound a little bit more on why it's important to do that centering and how other uh, movements and organizations can think about how they do that and not just rely on sort of the traditional ways of leading and advocating, okay? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. And I mean, I think the first part of it really is um, echoing what Jalen just said. I mean, it's really just acknowledging the existence of uh, Black trans women and Black trans people as a whole, because I mean, we, we have been here and Black trans women have been at the forefront of so many movements. But as we see, even with cis women in history, it's just the erasure of their presence and their impact and their influence and their resilience as well. Um, and for me, that's, you know, it's, it, it is an interesting uh, space to navigate because we know too, as Black trans people in our own community, that is also another barrier of um, having that acceptance among ourselves. Um, and that's a very, <laughs> that, that is also a very complicated conversation um, and, and moment that I've really had to experience as well. Um, I mean, I'll be very transparent. It has been kind of a, a source of anxiety for me to be the chair and more public facing person of an organization that now has a lot of attention because you know when you see me you're you're going to notice that I'm black first and then there's this fear in the back of my mind it's like well what's going to happen when they find out I'm trans and what will that change in their perspective and will that you know put our um our opportunities at risk because of the discrimination or the lack of understanding um, that people still have about trans people and non-binary people um, as someone who doesn't identify as a gender at all. Um, so that, that's something that's also been on my mind a lot. But kind of as I was saying earlier in the beginning of this, I mean, I think it's just really understanding that all these issues that we're fighting for, um, ending youth incarceration, like fighting homelessness, you know, healthcare, job discrimination, all these things, are issues that trans people are part of. I mean, even feminism, you know what I mean? My start as, a, um, as an organizer was partially through the Women's March and I was out as a non-binary person through that. And that was a very interesting space to navigate as someone who is affected by 
um, issues that we put under women's issues, but doesn't necessarily identify as a woman. And so it's not to say that they can't be called those, but it's just broadening the scope and realizing that um, we are involved in everything. Um, and that that is a deeper part of intersectionality. Um, and I think further, um, since we're also talking about, um, you know, defunding the police and even a lot of discussions surrounding abolition. Um, I also think about the recent quote from Angela Davis that she said that trans people have really kind of been the blueprint and breaking down these heavily ingrained systems in our society, you know, um, I'm going to read it directly, but she said, if we want an intersectional perspective, the trans community is showing us the way. The trans community has taught us to challenge that which is perceived to be normal. If we can challenge the gender binary, we can challenge prisons. And I think that is very uh, vital, that even just in our existence, we are redefining some of these very deeply uh, institutional systems and that we can also apply that to other things as well. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the, that answer. Um, Elaine, I'd like to move to you and ask you about, um, you talked a little bit about some of the issues that uh, transgender individuals experience around housing and homelessness. And I'm wondering about how you're seeing the law and various regulations either helping or hurting the ability of uh, trans and non-binary individuals uh, ability to access ha um, housing and get out of homelessness. Thank you. You know, I, I think of an anecdote from one of our clients who um, during COVID was attempting to access either both um, a day shelter and an overnight shelter at one place. And um, knowing that it, she was, it, you know, engaging with other clients there that were simply not even acknowledging her, their transness. Um, and, you know, at the kinder end, we're misgendering them. And at the at the at the harder, more difficult end to to bear, uh, just hearing all these pejoratives about who they are and what they were, um, and when I'm engaging with the city, you know, they they kind of just threw up their hands and said, you know, the 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 staff to client ratio is is pretty deep. It's like one staff for 25 clients. There's an incredible turnover. So even when you're doing uh, when you're going in to do these trainings and teaching staff and, and laminating posters and um, putting rainbow flags up on things and stickers in the windows. Um, uh, you know, and there's this famous local YouTube video. It's like, put a rainbow on it as a way to, it's like that, a rainbow sticker on the door and a rainbow sidewalk does not make a safe community. Um, and I really appreciated that. And her, her response was like, you just kinda, you know, like where there's such a dearth of, of services and resources that everything is stretched just drum tight that it makes it very really difficult so our challenge really was to to push back and say okay how do we how do we create a shelter for trans people for non-binary folks well we really can't because you know when we get these federal dollars there's these you know you can't uh, you can't even do set asides for trans people. So, I mean, our next hurdle is to go back into the the matrix code of uh, of how the, the, these laws actually work and say, you know, what are the discriminatory pieces that are in place? What are, how are the systems designed to continue to discriminate against people? Why is the most effective housing for trans people that we've seen in Washington state uh, private homes with three, four, or five bedrooms organized by private individuals um, that are designed as what they call launch pads, not crash pads. And they have short-term uh, bunks in the basement to medium-term, short-term couple months to long-term people that are in the houses, all run by private people. And why are those the most successful models for transgender and non-binary people? And so we're uh, we're providing a, a tremendous amount of pushback against all of these systems and um, making sure that uh, that there is equity and that these conversations are happening. Thank you so much. Um, Denise, I know that you're, oh, there you are. I see you again. <laughs> um, I'm going to go into the, uh, uh, the, Supreme Court case a little bit and and ask you this because were you surprised 
to see um, a decision that was so supportive of LGBTQ plus employment rights coming out of a Supreme Court that is so highly conservative. And is there, do you see any cause for hopefulness out of that? Or is there a caution that you have? What's, what's your, uh, what's your, what's your... <laughs> um, first, I apologize. My uh, internet blinked out right as this was starting. So I'm on my phone. So it's like precariously balanced. Um, so I, um, I mean, I can't be hopeful about this court's view of LGBTQ rights when it's also a court that has upheld things like detention of undocumented people, including undocumented children. Um, you know, LGBTQ people in ICE detention are 97 times more likely to be sexually assaulted um, in immigration detention than the general population of folks in immigration detention. Um, so. I don't think hope is a is a word that I use with the legal system anymore. Um, and I say anymore, not because the legal system has changed, but because of my own learning process. Um, I will say that what I saw in this decision was that this was a decision that kept the court in line with how cases have been decided by lower courts all across the country. Um, and I, what I worried, my fear about this case and the, what the decision would look like was that these justices um, and the conservative majority of these justices would rule based on how they feel about the worth of LGBTQ lives and not about how the law should be read. Um, and um, so I was um, shocked, I think is a word that I would use to see that, um, that, that this was a decision um, that came out about the law um, and that really held with, with um, with what the precedent had been. And, and I really do want to honor um, the work of, um, of the, the, the many, many um, people who have worked on these cases before. I mean, um, these, we would not have this decision today if not for the work of Black women, Black trans women. Um, and specifically, there was a woman named Polly Murray who, um, who when the, when the when Congress was deciding whether to include sex discrimination in the Civil Rights Act at all, wrote a memo describing how important it was to include sex discrimination as a protected category. And, um, and what she pointed out was that the, the race equity goals of the Civil Rights Act could never be met if women were not also protected because it's almost impossible for black women to, be, to tell whether they're being discriminated based on race or based on sex. Um, and I think, um, I, I will tell you my years of litigation, I've met a lot of people who have engaged in discrimination as a whole. They have generally not been pretty, they have not been picky about whether, you know, which protected class they're discriminating on the basis of. Um, and so I, I am really grateful for her vision and also the, um, the work of black trans women who brought some of the earliest cases. Um, there was a woman named Dee Farmer who, as far as um, I have seen in, in sort of legal history is the first out trans woman and a black trans woman to bring a case um, arguing that she and, and other trans women who are incarcerated with her should be protected from assault um, based on their status as trans women. And Felicia Barnes, um, who was, uh, is, um, she's still alive um, as far as I know, um, brought one of the, the earliest employment discrimination cases arguing that, um, that as a black trans woman, woman, she needed to be protected under sex discrimination. Um, and she won her case in the lower courts. And so I was very pleased to see the court go, you know, uphold that, that work. And, you know, this, this is, this is, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I'm so grateful for Justice Gorsuch for writing this decision. And, and I am not grateful to Justice Gorsuch because he just did the job that was laid out in front of him to do. I am grateful that he did that job. Okay, well said. I appreciate it. Um, Leah, I feel like these federal rules and regulations have been part of the bane of your existence, particularly as they have been changed under this administration. And I'm curious about um, what is it that you think advocates can do um, um, around these rules and um, uh, to, to change them, to comment upon them? What, what's available to people to fight back when we see changes being made that are so harmful to our communities? 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think the first thing to mention is on this recent Section 1557 rule, I think there were over 200 or close to 200,000 comments submitted, which is pretty amazing, right? And I would say the majority in opposition to these rules. So getting your voice out there is important. Um, I would say, similar to Denise saying, you know, I don't have much hope. Um, is that voice going to matter, matter to this administration? Frankly, probably not. They, the rule they promulgated that then everyone commented on was almost identical to the one they eventually passed, right? So what we change is not necessarily what the rule is going to be. What we can do is start changing from a cultural and community perspective, right? Because I think what we're trying to do right now is institute change from the ground up. We are not going to change this administration's mind. What we can do to work together to change communities, to make sure everyone's seen, people aren't invisible, to embolden our communities to actually rise up and effectuate change. Um, I'm a big component of uh, the law changing because of community. The law changes super, super slowly. We are stuck years and years and years behind community. But at the same time, it does eventually change. Um, in a recent panel, I was talking about uh, marriage equality and how marriage equality, when it occurred, it was after so, so many years of changing hearts and minds and many, many cases that came before it, before we actually got to a place where the Supreme Court was willing to rule for marriage equality. Way, way too late and way, way after everyone on the ground basically was already there. Um, I don't think we're going to change the hearts and minds of this administration, but what we can do is continue building the community and the culture so that we are able to change things um, as we move forward over the years. That's great. And I think the opportunity too is within our organizations, um, the way that we um, uh, engage in, 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 a, in a culture of belongingness so that uh, one of the things that I feel really strongly about our rights as people in the United States is that we really ought to just have the right to be who we are, how we say we are, who we are, you know, and that's what we all need to fight for and then embrace and acknowledge all of our siblings in all the ways that they show up, right? So there was this really lovely question that came through um, from an audience member that I, and so I'm going to uh, close us out on asking each of you to answer this question. And it's extremely important. And right now, you know, we're in the pandemic that is stressful in myriad ways and, and serves as this low level buzz of anxiety over everything, right? Because this is health pandemic. And then of course we have the racism pandemic, which is showing up in big ways and people are out in the streets and that's beautiful, but it's hard work. And then we have, you know, around LGBTQI plus issues and particularly for trans women and black trans women, issues of visibility, issues of safety, issues of danger. And all of you are such powerful advocates in various ways to fight for justice and equality and equity. And as I said, the right to just be who you are and live freely. So the question was, sorry for that long, long prelude, but you know, the question, the beautiful question is, what are the ways that the folks on this call have found most useful to rest, rejuvenate, and stay encouraged doing this work? Um, if anyone of you is ready to go first, I'll let you go. I don't want to. Okay, Elaine, take it away. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually started taking notes on this. Uh, outside of COVID-19 years, uh, I've listened to what my passions are. I've just listened to myself and I realized that I love contributing to developing youth. I have a 14 year old son with my wife. I love singing. I love the outdoors. Uh, I've taken personal development courses. I went through Landmark and I found it to be uh, really enlightening. Uh, some of the structures that they provide there. Uh, I volunteer and have been a volunteer for about a decade with Camp Ten Trees and really understanding youth and really understanding the power and the, the aliveness that is with um, young people and what they can teach me and what they can contribute to both myself and to the community has just been so amazing. I also love camping and kayaking and so uh, just you know, put it, having my, my family, uh, you know, edified and built up through my work and making sure that um, we're not thriving in spite 
of my work, but because of it has been really important. We're really lucky to have structured at our um, office and within Gender Justice League, uh, just a set of fringe benefits, enough vacation, sick time, flexibility to be able to handle the way that life kind of comes at us. And so it's been really great to be able to be uh, inside of a structure that works for my family and also works for our employees. That is very inspiring. And Jay Lynn, you have the floor. Yeah, um, it, it's fresh on my mind uh, right before this meeting. Today has been back-to-back -back Zoom meetings, as uh, you know, most of you have been going through and uh, since 9 a.m. and uh, it's exhausting. Uh, I had a meeting from uh, two to four with uh, the Black Trans Task Force and we all entered the space just really tired and not only tired from, you know, the fear around COVID because of, you know, the immune, immune compromise status of us, but also working on this um, project is um, exhausting because we're having to daily look at the threat to our lives. Um, the, the, the exhaustion of working, you know, in spaces that are um, really ruled by white supremacy, right? And uh, figuring out how to navigate that. And then just the exhaustion of having to work period. You know, I think all of us just get tired. Um, uh, and especially now during COVID, it feels like, I, I honestly feel like I'm doing so much more work now because I'm so so accessible. The work's right here. It doesn't take a lot of, there's no resistance to me getting to work. Um, I just, I'm, I'm working a lot, but I went in just so tired and I didn't think I could make it through the meeting and about 10 minutes in, we were all in lively discussion and laughing and talking over each other like we do. And like really, and dealing actually with a really hard issue at the same time. And I real, my energy level had just spiked and it's because I was with community. And so that's what rejuvenates me. So I think if there are black folk, um, if there are black trans folk, black uh, gender diverse folk who are, who are watching this, Go get community. Like it is, it's it's vital for our survival. Um, it always has been. Go find your peeps. It will help absolutely. That's awesome. Who's next? Um, I can go next. Thanks. Um, just because I was also thinking about community as well. Uh, it's a very common saying that a lot of queer and trans people we have are our chosen family, and that. Um, has really been a vital source to me, especially over the past few months, um, whether it be my partner or my friends, and, and knowing that even if we're not directly talking about the issues that are happening, um, that they understand it on just an intimate level within their own lived experience, and that I don't have to explain myself, um, as I feel like that's also something a lot of trans people in particular get tired of doing is explaining themselves, why they identify all of those things. Um, so knowing that I don't have to do that and can truly be myself um, in that. And I think, um, I mean, on, a, on another note, I, even though I'm more, have been more known for my work with BLM and everything, um, I always say I'm first and foremost a musician always and playing music is always been my uh, initial passion, uh, despite organizing our activism and all those things. And um, it's really helped me channel a lot of those feelings um, that I've experienced in regards to gender and just transition. And on that note too, I mean, I think for me, at least personally, it's been, um, it's just been, it, it helps me to really just reflect on, on how far I have come in terms of coming out and transitioning and all of the ways that I have asserted myself more and more of who I truly am in my life. Um, I mean, I know I talked about earlier um, that Title VII was especially close to me because I'd never come out at a job, but I actually have at my most recent job and that has been a very liberating <laughs> moment for me. And so I think sometimes, you know, we all, because this journey is so, it's just so, it's just highly personal, intimate and tailored to everyone. And so I think sometimes for us, it's easy to like forget really how much progress and growth we make in continuing to be our most authentic selves. So taking time to reflect on that and to see that like, I really have made a lot of, of progress in that and continue to be who I am. And that, that feels good. Also beautiful. Thank you so much. Okay, Leah or Denise, who's going? Um, 
I can go. So definitely echoing uh, the importance of connections, especially during this time, and how incredibly important it is just to connect with my colleagues, with my friends, with community members. I also think uh, listening. I think listening can really, uh, I can find it both restful and rejuvenating to sort of hear what people are saying and uh, try to understand how we can implement change through that. And lastly, just being outside. I find being outside the most restful and rejuvenating thing um, I can do. Well, I think, um, let's see, what's been working for me? I think um, what I have found really healing is, um, is actually doing the work of, of of unlearning white supremacy culture, um, which I realize as a, as a white person sounds a little precious. Um, but what I will say is that this is a white supremacy culture and the, the norms of perfectionism, black and white thinking, and, and um, really deep judgment <laughs> that comes with it um, uh, is a really deeply harmful system. And, um, and so what I have found really healing is, is to do that work of, of learning what it is, learning what it is that we're all sort of simmering in um, and, and learning to see it. Um, and that has, that has been really carrying me a lot um, as, as we, we sort of grapple with these pandemics. Um, and I think it, it helps me also to think about, um, about where brilliance, where brilliance is. Um, I feel very inspired by, by the brilliance of, of the people around me um, and the brilliance of, of groups like the Washington Black Trans Task Force, the Trans Women of Color Solidarity Network, Queer the Land, like these groups of people that are thinking in these really you know, explosive and expanding ways um, and engaging in this community caretaking that is so far out of the norms that I grew up used to as a white person. Um, and the other thing that has really been helping me is um, to, to really go local. Um, and I think this is something that I would put out as sort of, a, as sort of an action item for, for everyone who is, who is listening is, you know, I think um, sometimes we, we feel this desire, particularly in times where we, where we see a lot of crises around us, we, we feel a desire to go big. Um, and what has really centered me is going, is going local and thinking about who is in my community and how can I support people in my immediate community that understand the needs of my immediate community, my neighbors really well, um, and, and giving my support to those folks. And so I think that would be kind of my, my ask for everyone attending here is to, to look around and you know, where you feel like you have extra funds or extra energy to put them towards some of the, the organizations that are here in Washington, here in Seattle, and really, you know, doing really deeply local work. Um, because I think that's, that's really where our healing is coming from, right? Healing, healing is, not, is not a big thing. It's, it's a small thing. It's a thing that happens with your friends and neighbors, and, it, and it's a thing that needs to be led by the people who know our communities best. So, um, so I guess I'll just put in a plug that, um, you know, if you have some extra funds kicking around one way that you can, you can be supportive and, and do some of that healing work in our city and our, in, in your own communities is to support some of the organizations that you're hearing from tonight because, um, every one of us is engaged in that healing work. Um, and I'm, I'm just really proud of everyone that has, has, you know, I've seen the workload of, of everyone <laughs> increase exponentially. And so many people who are doing this movement work are doing it out, you know, unpaid in, in addition to day jobs. And I just really, um, you know, this is what is going to heal us ultimately. That's really outstanding. I really appreciate that. And I was certainly going to make a plug for all of the uh, organizations represented here, Gender, Gender Justice League, Lavender Rights, Q Law, um, uh, Black Lives Matter, Seattle, et cetera. Um, these are powerful organizations led by the people who know best what is needed for their communities. And uh, that's something that we need to support. And I'm so honored and so pleased that each of you participated here today um, and allowed us to have this uh, beautiful conversation that allowed for visibility, that allowed for truth telling, 
um, that allowed for explorations of both our successes and our areas where we're still waiting to get a success, but it's coming. So thank you so much, each of you, um, Elaine and Leah, Ebony, Jalen, Denise, for being here. Um, thank you so much to our ACLU staff behind the scenes who make this a reality and are doing all kinds of important things that you can't even see. Um, and also, I really want to thank everybody who's uh, logged on today um, for your interest, for your dedication, for your passion. Um, Together, we get through this, right? Together, we build a community that cares and we will get through it together. So I wanna remind you to check out the Pride playlist on the ACLU of Washington Spotify and the KEXP Pride podcast. And the links are on our website on the event page and they're probably also in the chat box. And let me just double check the chat box myself to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. I am not, the links are there. May you all have a beautiful, relaxing evening. Stay safe, mask up, be yourself, be alive, be joyful. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening.